The world of self-supported ultra-distance cycle racing can seem a strange subculture, but it's growing. Increasing numbers of supporters view it as a more honest form of endurance racing than many professional cycling events like the Tour or Giro. Emily Chappell has captured the essence of being one of those strange, sleep-deprived, exhausted riders in her book Where There's a Will, which was published towards the end of last year. She came to this type of racing after spending six years as a cycle courier in London, an experience that also led her to writing, initially a blog and later her first book, What Goes Around, published in 2016. For this podcast, I've asked Emily to read excerpts from both books to guide our conversation, so it will sound a little different to other podcasts, and I hope you like it. Do let me know. The first book starts with Emily working as a receptionist in London, and I couldn't work out why she was doing that when she had a good Cambridge degree, spoke Arabic, and also had a degree from SOAS University. I quite simply couldn't find any other job. So I, it's a long time ago now, but I, I left Cambridge in 2005. And when I look back in hindsight, I was completely naive and wet behind the ears. I was a child. I didn't know how the world worked. I'd done quite well in my degree, which was quite a cloistered environment. But I didn't know what jobs were available or what sort of career a person like me should have or what even I would want to do. So I thought, right, OK, English degree, maybe I should go and work in um, copywriting or HR or something. So I applied for all of these, all sorts of jobs in London and didn't get any of them and felt like an absolute loser. It was a very difficult time because I'd gone from the middle of the year, like I graduated with a Cambridge first and everyone said, the world's your oyster. And I felt like I was on top of it all. And then I had this very humiliating six months or so in London where I simply couldn't find a job. I was unemployed applying for jobs full time. And it was it was pretty miserable. And when I got a reception job, I just clung to it because thank goodness now I had a job and I could buy food and pay the rent. Good qualifications don't necessarily lead to good jobs. But I think a big part of it was just not knowing how the world worked. But you saw something as a receptionist that tempted you into a different line of work. I did. Yeah, I my first few, well, always really, but my first few weeks in London, it was a big new world. I come from very small, you know, town and small towns and countryside. So I had my eyes and ears open. I was fascinated by everything and everyone I saw. You know, there were so many different things around me, different people. And I did used to walk around town thinking, oh, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could be that. Maybe that's what I want to do. And there was one particular day where I was sitting behind my reception desk and this cycle courier, she was a girl, pulled up. And she just seemed like the coolest person I had ever seen. I was not cool back then in any way, shape or form. I never had been. I'd always been a total nerd and didn't really know what I was doing, didn't know what to wear, didn't didn't know, you know, as I, as I said, I was very naive. And this goddess strolled into my reception, handed me a package I signed for it. She just kind of left her bike leaning up against the window and then she got out, got back on the bike and zipped off into the traffic. And I think, I mean, in hindsight, I've I've amplified it, but I just remember sitting there slack-jawed thinking, my God, I wish I was that sort of person. And it wasn't for a couple of years that I realised that I could just do that if I wanted to. You didn't have to be a particular sort of person. By far my strongest memory of those first few weeks on the road is the exhaustion, which flavours, obscures and crowds out most of the others. I wasn't entirely unprepared for the rigours of career life. I'd spent the previous summer avoiding my master's thesis by going out on very long bike rides. But even so, I'd failed to anticipate falling asleep into my dinner and being in bed by nine every evening, having abandoned the unequal struggle with my drooping eyelids. And if falling asleep was all too easy, getting up became much, much harder. I had always been an early riser. Now it felt as if an unusually strong gravitational force were pinning me to the bed. Thursday, I learned, is the real killer. You already have three days of hard riding in your legs and your body's crying out for a rest day. And unless you've been scrupulous in getting yourself to bed early, 
once you've overcome the exhaustion of the first month, it becomes just as easy to stay up till 1am as it always was, though you'll regret it far more the following day. You're also vague and dizzy with sleep deprivation. Friday is somehow never quite so bad, infused as it is with the adrenaline of everyone else's last minute deadlines and the promise of a whole weekend's rest in just a few hours' time. Why on earth is there a glamour behind being a courier? Well, that's a very good question, because when um, when you're doing the job on the inside, it's sort of the opposite of glamorous. I mean, you're you're permanently exhausted. You smell really bad because no matter how often you wash your clothes, you're just constantly sweating into them and all the road fumes and everything. And you're ragged because your clothes wear out very quickly and you can't afford to replace them until they actually fall apart. And you spend a lot of time at the very bottom of the uh, the food chain, as it were, ignored and insulted and patronised by receptionists and security guards and taxi drivers and police officers and everybody, really. So there's a side of it that is decidedly unglamorous, but is at least real. And then the, the glamorous side of it, I guess, is the fact that you get to do this thing that's really fun and exciting. You know, ride your bike around in traffic all day, uh, while most people sit at a desk feeling bored and wishing they were out riding their bikes. I don't know. I, I talk about it in the book. There's this incongruity of cycle careers, because when I first saw them and realised what they were, my reaction was that like, this shouldn't really exist. You know, nowadays, everything is automated and we've got vehicles and we've got all these systems and we've got the internet. It seems completely out of place to have actual people on bikes racing around delivering things. It's like something out of the Victorian era. I'm... And do they still exist, Emily? I was just wondering, as I couldn't help thinking, are they still going? They are, yeah, they're still going. So people have been pre predicting the demise of the industry since the late 90s when the internet started. And it has been in a gradual decline. And now, since I left, all the Deliveroo and Uber Eats uh, companies have started up. So that, that happened just after me. So I don't really have any direct experience of that. But in terms of numbers of people on the road on bikes delivering things, I'd say there are actually more now. Though the the food delivery people, I think, are, I think, generally considered a different breed from the sort of classic old cycle courier on his fixed gear bike with his beard. Yeah, I can't imagine them being quite so piratical. Oh, I think some of them are. They do their best. Um, okay. But it's still, there's always going to be a place for bikes, I think. It, that sort of started you off, didn't it? It started you writing, but it also gave you a great foundation in, in the cycling, although you'd obviously, as you've just said in that reading, done, done, done cycling previously. Um, talk to me a little bit about the, the writing side of things, please. Well, that was another really interesting thing. So you, you mentioned before, you know, I, I came into couriering with a couple of very good degrees. And my ambition, simply because it's all I really knew from being in academia, was to be an academic and, you know, go on, do a PhD and get tenure and uh, one day become a professor the way, um, you know, you'd expect. And I'd always wanted to, to write books. That was just something from my childhood that I had always thought I might do and wanted to do. And when I became a courier, I thought, right, OK, life is changing a lot. Now I'm going to become a manual labourer and I will put away the intellectual side of me and I won't do that anymore. This is this is a big change. And what actually happened was the opposite. It was fascinating. I instead found that my brain sort of woke up and my academic ambitions had been slowly wilting on the vine for a couple of years, you know, eventually died off completely. I now really, really wouldn't want to go back to that. But when I uh, started riding my bike around London every day, I also started writing and I started blogging about it and I started having something to say. And I think because I was part of the world and I wasn't just sitting in the library reading about things, I was out there watching them and meeting them and experiencing them. There is also something which I have yet to completely put my finger on about cycling and being outdoors just stimulating your your mind and your creativity cycling around all day and then having the weekend to sit around writing on a laptop was the perfect recipe for becoming a writer really so it actually couriering started me off as a writer 
And it got me to where I am today, which is where I always wanted to be, via a very different route. I thought I'd turned off the route and it turned out I'd just found this really interesting shortcut. Everything is harder in winter. The weather exerts its own tax on your finite energy resources, tiring you out even more just in the effort of keeping warm. I began to notice when the temperature dipped below zero that I'd fall asleep an hour earlier than usual, no matter how slow work had been. In fact, when work was slow, it got harder because I wasn't able to keep myself warm by cycling. And where in the summer, you'd simply prop your bike up outside a building, close your lock around the front wheel in one swift movement and jog into the reception. At half past four in late December, you first have to take your gloves off, plucking awkwardly at the Velcro around the wrist with fingers that are still numb from the cold, despite the layers of fleece and Gore-Tex they're wrapped in, and biting the tips of your fingers in an effort to get them out of the gloves without turning the lining inside out, which will make them even more difficult, fiddly and time-consuming to put back on. Then you lock your bike up, then you start to put your gloves back on, then you remember about your lights and remind yourself that it's not worth risking it because you've already had two sets stolen when you left them on the bike as you ran into a shop to buy pasta or milk, and you never know when a usually straightforward pickup might take much longer than usual. Maybe the receptionist will be away from her desk, or the files will still be downloading, or the person who booked the job will have got the address wrong, and after 20 minutes of confusion, you'll figure out that you were actually meant to be four doors down. So you unhook and unscrew and unwrap your lights from seat post and handlebars, these now familiar motions prompting the now familiar resolution to find a way of attaching lights to your bag and radio, as you've seen other couriers do. A resolution that grows fainter with every reiteration, and that you won't actually get round to fulfilling until your third winter on the road. To what extent is that sort of endurance good training for later endurance rides you've done? So I, I think couriering has been a fundamental foundation for my endurance career. Um, not only because I'm used to being tough and riding through sleet and snow and rain and exhaustion and heat and all the rest of it, but I think for the very basic reason that you have to keep going, you have to do it, you have to get up every day and get on the bike, whether you want to or not, no matter what the weather's doing, no matter how tired you might feel or ill, because it's your job, you have to go and do it. And if you don't do it, either you can't pay the rent or you will lose your job. So there's a limit to how many times you can you can call in sick. And so it almost ceases to be a decision. You don't wake up and think, oh, do I feel like it today? Do I want to do it? You just get on with it because you have to. And that's quite useful in a multi-day event because uh, you constantly question, why am I doing this? Do I even like it? What, what, what am I doing here? But I think from couriering, I had the automatic thing of, well, you just get up and get on your bike and, you know, worry about that later. And I think that really helped. And yeah, as I said, I, I just got used to keeping going when it was really hard and it was really hard in all sorts of ways. You've cycled across Asia, you've been across Iceland, you've done Anchorage to Seattle. Were you couriering at the time? Were they hold, I'm not sure of the chronology. Were they at the time? Were they part of that? And I'm just wondering how they mixed, how this all came together to create, <laughs> I suppose, the, the, the racer that you are now. Well, most of those things, so the three trips you've mentioned, were all sort of interspersed with couriering. So I took... Uh, you know, uh, well, for Asia, I took 18 months off. Um, I thought I'd left, but I came back afterwards. And uh, for Iceland, I, I took a month or so off. And then um, I stopped careering just before I went out to Anchorage. And I didn't know if I would go back, but it turned out that was that was the last of it. So my last career shift would have been sometime in December 2014, which is a while ago now. At that point, I came back from that North American trip, which was wonderful. And I was writing What Goes Around at the time and moving into moving into both the endurance racing. So I did the Transcontinental for the first time that year and also making my living as a writer rather than as a career, which I which I still miss. I miss it terribly. But um... what do you miss? Because the bits we've picked don't sound like bits you would miss. Uh, I've not told you about all the good bits. I miss so much of it. I miss the, just the, the, it was often really fun. I miss the joy of being out there riding my bike around all day and feeling really good 
Um, Because once you've got it and once you're fit and you know what you're doing and you you get quite good at riding your bike in traffic because you have that much experience and doing something you're good at and fluent in is a wonderful feeling. And that that was great. And then being part of it all, you know, being out in the city, in the streets, seeing people running into other couriers, running into friends. Uh, I've heard you said that you also you, you when you were starting to write about this, you weren't sure whether or not you felt you had the authority to start writing about this, as if you were qualified enough to say it, given that you were still relatively new on the scene. I still worry that about everything I do. I think I, I just have um, towering imposter syndrome. I worried when I got the book deal for what goes around that all the other couriers would condemn me because, you know, I'd only been doing it five years and I had no business uh, trying to represent their community. And of course, no one did. They were all extremely proud and congratulated me and were very excited about it. And it's been the same with endurance racing. I felt like a massive imposter writing where there's a will I mean what do I know and no one else sees it that way everybody else is just really happy that there's a book about what they do and a lot of people have read it and said yeah that's what it's like so I think um, I have a tendency to assume that I'm much more of an outsider than I actually am so I'm going to introduce this one slightly because um, it's a It's part of a bigger story. So this is, uh, it would have been May 2015, and I have entered the Transcontinental, which starts in July, and I have no idea what I'm doing. I feel like I've bitten off more than I can chew, and I don't even know how you train or prepare for an event like this. So I've just thrown myself in, and I'm doing all these big events, and I'm constantly worried that it's too much and I'm going to fail. So this is um, an extract or two from when I attempted the Brian Chapman, which is a 600 kilometer Audax through Wales. I didn't have a clue how one was supposed to train for an event like this. So I decided simply to do as much cycling as I possibly could with a conviction that the more I suffered before the race, the less I would suffer once it started. Which is how I found myself lining up for the Brian Chapman a popular and infamous 600k Audax that takes riders from Chepstow to Anglesey and back again, routing them over every hill. Wales is one of the smallest countries in Europe, but there was still a fearful symbolism in riding its length twice in a single weekend, made worse by the fact that the Brian Chapman had hovered in my consciousness for years as an uncomfortably unattainable target that other riders had managed to achieve, but that was unquestionably beyond me. The night before the ride, I ensconced myself miserably in the corner of Weatherspoons in Chepstow. I quite often stopped in Weatherspoons for breakfast if I'd been riding all night, enjoying the cheap coffee and bacon rolls, the luxurious toilets, and the company of gentle red-nosed men on their first pint of the day. But now I sat alone, ignored by the tipsy teenagers who make up Weatherspoons evening clientele, scanning the menu to find the most calories for the least money, and texting every friend I could think of to seek some comfort for my building sense of dread. I knew somewhere in the furthest recesses of my mind that I was entirely capable of finishing this ride, but this knowledge was so expertly hidden by my habitual fear and self-doubt that I rarely met it face to face, and as I sat there in Weatherspoons, gloomily chewing on a microwave burrito, the fear and self-doubt flew about my head like bats, feeding off each other, growing bigger and bigger. I'm going to skip a bit. I go back to the first control. I camp for the night. I wake up. There's all these tall, intimidating men who don't talk to me. And then we set off. And by the time we reached the first control at Talgarth, I realised I had left my doubts behind in Chepstow, like a skin I'd sloughed off or a chrysalis I'd emerged from. A man I befriended over breakfast assured me that there was no obligation to follow the set route as long as you visited all the controls, and we successfully dodged the bank holiday traffic by crossing the River Wye and following a leafy lane up through Bowrood and Irwood, chattering along two abreast as the other riders struggled through the fumes on the A470. The ride used to go this way anyway, he told me, as we pedalled out of Reda towards the chain of Victorian dams that submerged farms and hamlets in order to send Welsh water to Birmingham. Two other men had joined our peloton, 
but cheerily decided there was no need to add one of Wales' most infamous climbs to what was already a painfully hilly route. I was familiar with the Elan Valley, having grown up a few miles east near the head of the Severn, and although I knew it wouldn't be an easy detour, this was trumped by the comfort of a road that held no surprises. Besides, it was a beautiful day to be out, just at the point where spring tipped over into summer, the sunshine throwing itself about the heavens, the clouds rolling busily along above us, and an orchestra of birds and insects heralding our progress through the country. I eventually lost my breakfast friend on the climb up towards the watershed between Raider and Camustworth. He waved me on apologetically, telling me that his legs weren't having a good day and set about chasing the white-haired man in the green and yellow jersey I could see up ahead of me, occasionally disappearing around a corner or over the brow of a hill, never quite within my reach. I was intoxicated by the strength of my legs, which seemed to be infused with all of the brightness and beauty of the day, and the unexpected plot twist that here I was, riding the Brian Chapman, and rather than grimly struggling and just about hanging on, I was enjoying it. How long did it take you to feel you belonged among these sort of riders? <laughs> it's been quite recent, actually. Um, I should have felt at home among these riders a lot, a lot sooner. Pro probably the second transcontinental. I felt like I knew what I was doing. and I felt like I deserved to be there. Um, but I still thought people would look at me and think, that I didn't belong for some reason. Did you go up through doing odd axes? I mean, did you do the 200, 300, 400, all that sort of thing? I've not done very many odd axes. Um, I've never bothered to you know, get involved in all the odd axes, badges and points and things like that. And when I lived in Wales, there weren't very many nearby. And so if you wanted to do an odd axe, you had to travel and stay somewhere. So it was easier just to go for a ride from my door. Now I live in Bristol, I do a few more because there's a lot that start from here. Though, of course, they've not been going on lately. Mm. And and were you trying to, were you, when you go out for a ride, were you just going for longer rides, thinking, well, I'll go there and making multi-day of it? I noticed you went to the coast recently. That was all I was, I was thinking of. You, you, went, you did a day trip down to the coast, I seem to think. Is that right? It was something like 300, 300 miles or something you decided to knock off? It was 300k, yeah. Okay. Um, that was that was lovely. That was one of the the lovely Audax routes that goes out of Bristol. Actually, I did it with Will, who organised it, um, and that was that was a very difficult but very beautiful route. Um, when I was preparing for the Transcon, I was living in London at the time, and I would just ride to wherever I needed to be. So a couple of times I went up to Manchester to see my sister. That was about four hundred k. Um, I think I was speaking at a festival in Clitheroe, so I rode up there once. Um, I was speaking at a festival in Edinburgh, so I rode up there. And when I look back, I did a heck of a lot of riding that year. But because I came into it thinking I'm a clueless amateur who doesn't know what she's doing, I was always focused more on what I wasn't doing than what I was. The, is that your training? Effectively, it is, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm fond of saying I don't really train and I don't train at all in the traditional sense I don't have a heart rate monitor I've never done an FTP test um, all of those uh, you know acronyms and what's and things I've no clue um, I really really love riding my bike and I do lots of it so I certainly prepare um, and if I know I'm doing a big event I will almost instinctively do bigger and bigger rides in the run-up and keep an eye on what I'm capable of um, but my training is is very, very old school. And I think a lot of people who are doing the sort of riding I do, the sort of races I do, would look at me and think, you are really missing a trick here. But I I like it. It's the Eddie Merckx thing, isn't it? Ride a bike, ride a bike, ride a bike. How important was the support of riders like Juliana Burring? Support is not so much of a thing because you're not really allowed to get very much actual support during a race like this um the the moral support is massive um and there's now quite a lot of people juliana included who over the years i've been in touch with during a race and you know occasionally texted to say i'm having a total meltdown what should i do and all they'll ever do is just say you're doing fine keep going don't worry i'm here and that sort of thing um or try and talk some sense into me 
Um, it's much more friendship than rivalry. Um, with Juliana in particular, we've we've only raced together, I think actually only ever once, I'm not sure. Um, and it felt almost irrelevant because she's a much stronger rider than me. So, you know, it's not a rivalry because she'll always win. Um, but it felt quite comfortable, I think, because we both you know, we had the same frame of mind. We were actually excited to be in the same event and thought we might run into each other. Um, and I think I find it more relaxing when I know somebody is stronger than me. So I know I can try as hard as I possibly can and go as hard as I want. And I still won't win, but I will, you know, I will have that to aim for. When talking about ultra-distance self-supported cycling, you have to mention Mike Hall, a pioneer of the sport, a Yorkshireman who, in 2012, smashed the record for cycling around the world, 18,000 miles in 91 days. Emily writes about their first meeting. She was giving a talk. Mike was in the audience. I was too shy to talk to him for most of the evening then mustered my courage at the last possible minute and pursued him up the stairs of the auditorium as he and his friend reached the door of the cinema, shrugging on their jackets. I caught up with him in the foyer and introduced myself, even though presumably he now knew who I was from my talk. I didn't like to assume he'd have paid much attention to someone whose achievements were so pedestrian compared to his. And I think I just wanted to say, I said, mainly because I had to say something to him now that I had his attention, that I really am amazed by what you've done because I know from what I've just done how hard it must have been and I know I couldn't do it. He thanked me with an air of polite surprise, seeming as embarrassed as I was. Through his moustache, I spied the ghost of a hair lip. How have you been? I asked. I mean, how are you coping since you got back? It's not been the easiest, he mused. I wasn't on the bike very much for a bit. I've picked up a few days couriering in Cardiff now, in fact, he said, with a nod to indicate that we had this in common. And, well, I'm taking the antidepressants. His candour surprised me, and for a moment the different versions of Mike Hall jostled against each other in my head. The record-breaking hero versus this softly spoken melancholic man who'd had trouble leaving the house. I was still a few weeks away from admitting I was in a similar state myself. But then he was a little way up the road from me, having finished his ride six months earlier. But it'll pick up, he told me. You know, when you're going through a really bad patch on the bike and you tell yourself this won't last. He paused and smiled for the first time. And you know, when you're going through a really good patch, you know that won't last either. We both laughed and he turned to the man beside him as if to apologise for the hold-up, then back towards me. Going for a point, if you fancy it. Mike Hall is a legend in ultra-distance cycling. He was the creator of the transcontinental race, which he went on to win the women's event, and Mike died when he was hit by a car during a race in Australia. Is it fair to say he became a good friend to you and mentor? Uh, Yes, it is. Um, I think he might dispute mentor. I'm not really sure. Um, I started off when I first met Mike, I assumed he was this, you know, this this legend who might one day deign to notice me. But of course, he didn't think of himself that way. And I think he was like, ah, oh, you like bikes too. We should be friends. So um, <clears throat> so we we became friends. And I think I might have thought, oh, you know, maybe maybe I can learn from the master. But I think what he actually wanted was someone to you know, hang out and collaborate with. So we used to go on these long rides and he'd say, I've got this theory for my next race. And um, rather than learning from him, I I ended up saying, well, yeah, let's let's talk about it. I'm not sure that works. Um, Or what about this? Um, And I think he he appreciated having having an ear to bend. He always had a lot of, well, he always had a lot of ideas. A lot of them were really good. Some of them were a little bit out there, but it was it was fun to to go through them. The only thing any of us leave behind are, are memories uh, and the amount of people who I've spoken to, and I'm not even in your world, who, who talk about Mike Hall, including Josh Ibbett on his podcast. It demonstrates just the power of the man. And I don't mean power on, on, on the bike. He, he clearly had a big influence in your world. Well, he was in many senses the founder of, or one of the founders of the the discipline that we have now. Um 
and self-supported ultra distance racing which is quite a mouthful has moved on um even just in the the three years since he passed away but he i think he planted the seeds that have now grown and will continue to grow and i mean who knows what he would be up to if he was around at the moment I think he would have taken it in some more very interesting directions or he'd have thought, right, well, this could go carry on without me now. I'm going to move away and do something else. Yeah, the film Inspired to Ride, which I think I watched a couple of weeks ago during lockdown on uh, on Amazon, it, he features very heavily in that. And that's a, it's a good little film. So does Juliana, of course. It's a very, very good little film, that, actually. Uh, let's talk about Mike's race, the transcontinental. You had two goes at it. Just tell me about the first one. The first go uh, was um, that year I told you about where I di- thought I didn't know what I was doing at all. Um, it turned out I did know what I was doing. So the main experience of, of the race was this growing realisation that I was fine. This is what I do. I was aware of other people around me and I was following um, you know, what was going on in the race on, on Twitter. So there were people ahead of me and people behind me and everybody was having their little disasters and things. And I realised that a lot of people were having a much worse time than I was or were, you know, ahead of me and doing well, but suffering and almost surprised by how much they were suffering and how hard this was. And I think, again, because I had, by that point, I'd been a courier for six years and I'd cycled across Asia. So I'd done a lot of touring and had all my ups and downs there. I was used to the fact that there's always something going wrong when you're doing a long bike ride. And I wasn't the slowest. I'd assumed that within 12 hours in the start of the race, I would be trailing behind the pack. But I was I was just there in the middle. I wasn't distinguishing myself, but I wasn't embarrassing myself either. And I had a really good time for a lot of it. It was the first time I'd cycled in the high Alps. That was just, that blew me away. It was one of those life-changing, oh my goodness, why have I not spent all my life here moments And yeah, it was great. And then I got a little bit overconfident and decided that sleep was for wimps and I was just going to carry on riding forever. And you can imagine how badly that went. I limped across Italy and eventually got to Slovenia and um, ended up in hospital with uh, mysterious chest pains, which turned out to be nothing very serious, but it it was a reason to stop racing. So I did eight days and the thing that fascinates me is that if you'd told me before the race that I wouldn't finish and that I would effectively fail, I would have been devastated. But I felt wonderful. So the following year, I went back and I went back with this narrative of I'm going back to finish the job. It was, ah, oh, in many ways, it was even more wonderful. I had two incredible, exhilarating weeks of riding across Europe and just the amount of beauty I saw the whole way, so many different countries and landscapes and people and incredible food and everything. It was, it was amazing. And then I finished, which was uh, getting to the end of something like that is quite an achievement. And I also won. I was the the first woman to finish. And that was a really strange experience because again, you would have assumed that would be the best feeling in the world. And it just wasn't, it was, um, it was much more complicated than that. Partly because I was knackered. So, you know, you get to the end and you don't really have the energy to be a triumphant hero. You just want to sit down and uh, eat some cheese. Yeah, it was it was a very interesting bundle of emotions. And I didn't feel anywhere near as good as I had the previous year when I failed. I don't know what we make of that. People follow this because you all have trackers and there's a dot watchers who can see exactly where you are. People, Some people at one stage thought you were going in the wrong direction to some other people. Uh, and you're always against the clock. How are you not, when you're doing this, riddled with doubt, uncertainty, sleep deprivation, exhaustion, just by the mental stress of all of that going on while your legs are trying to power you forward? Well, you are a bit, but I think because the effort of powering yourself forward is so great and all-consuming, all the doubts and fears tend to stay in the background. You've got so much going on just with the immediate demands of what you're doing, which is one of the reasons it's such an enjoyable thing, because it's very simple. Like at any given moment, you just need to keep going. So you need to keep pedaling and eat and sleep. And those things become the most important priorities for you. But they're all quite simple things. So life just takes on this glorious simplicity for a while. 
And then you don't really have the energy to think too much about, oh, my God, you know, what, what's happening? Where's everyone else? So I, I checked social media a few times a day. And there was usually a bit of chat about, you know, what's going on, who's where, who's failed, who's winning and all of that. And there were there were a few moments where, you know, when I was tired and run down, it tended to be in the afternoon for me. That was a bad point. You're then looking for something to get stressed out about. And you think, oh, great, I'll, I'll get stressed out about the competition. That will do. So I did, I did have some moments of paranoia, but in the, the vast majority of it was, was just this quite sort of private, solitary, I've just got to keep moving. And because the, because it's so long and because the finish line is so far away, you don't even really think about that. You don't think about where you're going or what, where you're trying to get to. You just think about keeping moving. Um, and that's quite, quite comfortable as well, bizarrely. It was only when I was standing under the warm shower in Kate and Leo's cramped hotel bathroom, having used my hands to hoist each stiff leg over the side of the bathtub, that I realised I had lost the sense of urgency I had worn like a mantle ever since Herodsbergen. My enjoyment of this shower need no longer be loaded with haste, and I cast my eye luxuriously around the bathroom, looking at the cracked tiles above the sink, Kate's toiletries arranged along the edge of the mirror, my lycra limply piled on the floor and the folded cotton t-shirts on the toilet seat. Time rolled away ahead of me in an abundance both fearful and seductive. I no longer had to grasp at it. I could let it go. Those of us who'd finished the race moved in slow motion around the town that weekend, our tan lines peeking out from the sleeves of the cheap t-shirts we'd bought from market stores often pausing to sit down or lean against walls and catch our breath. The flight of stairs up to Mike and Anna's control room on the first floor of the hotel might as well have been K2, and as I paused to assess the height and depth of each step and the number I'd have to climb before I reached advanced base camp, the landing, I'd often encounter another racer, hobbling studiously downward, gripping the handrail and smiling ruefully as his eyes met mine companionship easing our decrepitude from a concern into a joke. Much less than a week ago, I had sprinted up an external flight of stairs at the haunted Albanian hotel, carrying my loaded bike. It bothered me that I had proved myself capable of this so recently, yet couldn't muster the resolve to do it again. Is it really that bad? Well, I, I often ask myself this. I think actually it's it's worse than I remember because I tend to remember things really positively. Um, I look back on that race and just say, it was great. It was wonderful. In reality, I was usually uncomfortable, tired and in pain in some sort of way. But you you kind of gloss over that in, in hindsight. And I know that's what happens. So now, even when I'm doing a ride like this and it's very hard, I think, ah, oh, but I'll remember this fondly. Yeah, it's it's very hard. And I think when you're doing it, you're astounded by how hard it is and how hard a thing you can do and keep doing. Um, it's so far beyond what you think you'd be capable of. And, you know, within two or three days, you're exhausted and you think, I'm going to do another 10 days of this. I don't think that's possible. And then you do. Um, and it does quite intrigue me how difficult it is to get our heads around difficulty and toughness. Um, or to really understand them, except when we are right in the middle of them. Um, I, when I try to remember or describe or explain certain bits that were so tough, I can't quite manage it. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you've uh, have you read Touching the Void by Joe Simpson? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I know it quite well. And it's, it's, quite, it's a brutal book, as anyone who's read it will know. And what happened to him was terrible and at the end of the book he says it was way worse than I've been able to describe here and you just think wow it's this is one of the most horrible things I've ever read and he says I've not even managed to capture the half of it and that really rings true for me because I whenever I'm going through something that's very very difficult I think I've I've never managed to remember how bad this is I've never managed to tell anyone but I think that's something our minds do to protect us. Um, otherwise, we'd never try anything hard again. 
I have really, really happy, positive memories from my time racing, which is why I keep going back and doing it. There's a whole group of top athletes like yourself, though, now who are competing in a sport that's not really on the public radar. There's no money behind it. It's not on TV. So there's no real structure to earn a living through that. Is that a problem or is it a good thing? I think it's a good thing. If you compare um, self-supported racing to, you know, mainstream professional cycling, I think the latter is a far less healthy environment for all concerned. You know, people's motivations are incredibly compromised by all of the, the money that's involved. And it's a very cruel system. And look at how many former pro cyclists have had breakdowns, have committed suicide, are generally really unhappy and messed up. You know, back in the day, I would have loved to have been a pro cyclist. And now I look back and think, wow, I'm really, really glad I never managed to go down that path. I think it's it's much more honest doing it this way. There's much less of an incentive to to cheat. I'm sure some people do. I'm sure it's it's happened. But you do it for itself rather than because, you know, your career depends on it or your income or anything like that. That is changing a bit. There are people who are making careers not directly out of being a professional endurance racer and prize money, because there isn't really any, but people are making subsidiary careers out of being on social media and representing brands and all the rest of it. One of the things that has always appealed to me and I think to everyone is that the transcontinental, for example, is based around ordinary people. It's two weeks in the summer so you can do it as part of your summer holiday. So Christoph Allerhert, who won the first few, he um, works as a teacher um, and just, you know, he's got a summer holiday. This is what he does with it. And most people, I don't know about now, actually, but most people who did it for the first few years were just ordinary people who have jobs and like to ride their bike a really long way. I'm actually quite unusual in that I don't really do much apart from ride my bike and write and speak about it. Most people fit it in around a career. And that's wonderful. And there is now, there are more and more professional and former professional cyclists coming into um, this sort of racing. So uh, Lachlan Morton won GB Duro last year. And this year, there's a couple of um, ex-pros uh, racing in GB Duro. And I, I feel quite wistful about this because um, it's not their fault. But once the pros get hold of something, it becomes more professionalised. It's harder for an ordinary person with a lot of strength, intelligence and you know, diligence to distinguish themselves. And I don't know, something is lost, but then something is also gained. You know, this is a discipline evolving. And an interesting one too. My huge thanks to Emily Chappell. The two books she read from are titled What Goes Around, that's the career one, and Where There's a Will, about ultra-distance self-supported racing. I'll put links to both in the show notes, along with Emily's website and social media. You can find podcasts in our library with other great cyclists, such as mountain biker Lee Craigie, fastest woman around the world, Jenny Graham, Paralympian Karen Dark, Sarah Ooten, and not forgetting the men, Josh Ibbett, Jonas Deichmann, Sean Conway, Marcus Stitz, Chris Poutney. We've had a lot of cyclists for a podcast that's not really about cycling. This one with Emily was a little bit different to usual. Please let me know if you like it. Use any of my social media links at alwaysanotheradventure.com. And if you did like it, perhaps consider buying me a virtual coffee. It's a small contribution towards the hosting and other costs associated with making these podcasts. There's also a link for that at alwaysanotheradventure.com. I'm Simon Willis. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye.